Okay, so we'll move along and we'll introduce our next speaker, actually, who is Phil Cafaro. Phil, uh, Phil is an associate professor of philosophy at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. He is a former ranger with the U.S. National Park Service. Currently, his main research uh, interests are in environmental ethics, consumption, and population issues, and wild lands preservation. He is the author of Thoreau's Living Ethics from the University of, Chicago, of Georgia Press. He is currently working on a book entitled Bleeding Hearts and Empty Promises, a Liberal Rethinks Immigration, and is also co-editor of a forthcoming anthology, Apply the Breaks, Environmentalists Confront Population Growth. Phil is here with us today to discuss the environmental arguments for stabilizing U.S. population. Phil Cavaro. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thanks to the National Press Club for hosting this event. And uh, of course, thanks to Leah Durant and Rachel McCann for all their good work uh, putting it on together. And thanks to all of you for, for coming. The environmental argument for stabilizing America's population is relatively straightforward. Population growth contributes significantly to many environmental problems uh, within our borders, including air and water pollution, uh, sprawl, uh, crowding, etc. As an environmentalist I recently interviewed for my book put it, it's hard to think of a single environmental problem that population growth does not make worse. And of course, a growing population uh, um, increases our footprint beyond our borders, our disproportionate role in stressing global environmental systems. Of course, we think about uh, carbon emissions and global climate change. So continued U.S. population growth doesn't appear to be compatible with ecological sustainability, either nationally or globally. So environmentalists should support stabilizing America's population and then hopefully slowly reducing it. To work, this effort has to include generous funding for family planning, for sex ed in our schools, uh, a commitment to the continued legal availability of abortion, and a reduction in current high levels of immigration into the U.S. Now, it seems to me that this um, conclusion rests on a straightforward commitment to mainstream environmentalism and on easily confirmed empirical facts about the problems facing it. Despite this, it isn't the consensus position among American environmentalists. And uh, I'm just going to show you a few comments that I've uh, gotten during interviews with Colorado environmentalists over the past couple of months, mostly members of the Sierra Club. You can see them up there. So why aren't en environmentalists in America talking about population? Well, the reason can be stated in one word, immigration. Uh, some environmentalists support continued high levels of immigration, but really most of us are just um, uncomfortable talking about the topic, and so we avoid discussing it. Here's my favorite comment. It became very ugly. This is referring back to the 98 debate within the Sierra Club. It became very ugly. And I'm a social worker. I'm about as far from a racist as you can get. It was very uncomfortable, and uh, it's not my area of expertise. So, so strong is this aversion to talking about immigration that groups like the Sierra Club, which during the 1970s and even during the 19, uh, up through the 1980s, had pretty strong uh, statements on uh, stabilizing U.S. population have basically dropped domestic population growth as an issue. Uh, several years ago, the group Zero Population Growth went so far as to change its name to Population Connection, or PC for short. And here's another quote from my, uh, my uh, Sierra Club friends. Whatever happened to ZPG? It doesn't seem as if we've got a national ZPG movement anymore. I can't find an article with a reference to them. And I explained to him that the folks at ZPG basically took one of the most recognizable brand names in, in, uh, in America and replaced it with something bland that, that nobody knows about and that doesn't really seem to stand for anything. So in 2006, the U.S. Uh, passed the 300 million mark in population, 95 million more people than were here for the first Earth Day in 1970 with almost no comment from environmentalists. In 2007, Congress debated uh, an immigration bill which would have uh, greatly increased the amount of immigration into the U.S. and therefore our population down the line, and environmentalists were, were by and large completely silent about that. So like population and immigration policy for the past 50 years, it looks like population and Im immigration policy for the next 50 
are going to be debated with no regard to the environmental consequences. I think that's a bad thing. As a committed environmentalist, I'd like to see my government setting immigration policy and all uh, government policy with regard to sustainability. I don't think the goals that I share with my fellow environmentalists and with most of my fellow citizens, clean air and clean water, livable uncrowded cities, sharing the land generously with other species, uh, I don't think these are compatible with continued population growth. It's time to rein in this growth or just forthrightly admit that we're not going to achieve a sustainable society in the United States. In a recent paper, a, coll a colleague and I lay out the environmental argument for stabilizing America's population in some detail, and that's available as a Center for Immigration Studies background, or you can download that from your, their website if you'd like. Uh, here I'd just like to hit some of the main parts of that argument and consider one or two objections to it. So an obvious place to start is with this question. How much difference does immigration really make to America's population growth? The answer is a lot. Steve Camerata is going to discuss this in detail uh, in the next talk, and so I'll just mostly defer to him on this topic. But I want to put up one slide um, referencing it to show that uh, in the near future, at least, immigration is clearly the main driver of U.S. population growth. So here's a Census Bureau study that many of you will be familiar with. came out in 2000. Um, and basically, it's projecting population out 100 years from 2000. Under the zero series, we're imagining zero immigration annually. Under the middle series, a little less than 1 million annually. And under the highest series, a little more than 2 million annually. And you can see that in 2100, we're looking at either 377 million people, 571 million people, or 854 million people. That last number is uh, on the order of three times as large the population as we have now, a little bit less. So obviously, uh, immigration, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, makes a huge difference to future uh, U.S. population. When Congress sets immigration policy, it's essentially also setting a national population policy. But this begs a second question. How much difference does a rapidly increasing population make to our environmental problems? Is it really as important as I'm claiming? Yes, it is. Um, population growth contributes significantly to a host of environmental problems within our borders. Let me just briefly consider uh, one of them urban sprawl. And whenever I talk about sprawl, I like to uh, show a picture of Los Angeles. Just because I, if I was being honest, I'd show a picture of Denver in the state where I live, and I could show you Phoenix or many places. But if we're going to talk about sprawl, let's look at, look at Los Angeles. In the past two decades, sprawl, defined as new development on the fringes of existing urban and suburban areas, has come to be recognized as an important environmental problem in the U.S. Between 1982 and 2001, the U.S. converted 34 million acres of forest, cropland, and pasture to developed land use. That's an area the size of Illinois. And the rate of sprawl conversion has increased over that time as well. So it's a problem, and it's a problem that seems to be getting worse. I won't go into all the reasons why sprawl is an environmental problem, from crowding to loss of habitat to increased air pollution. Most of you will be familiar with that. So what causes sprawl? Well, many things, it turns out. Transportation policies that favor building roads over mass transit, uh, zoning laws that uh, encourage leapfrog development, uh, tax policies can in increase sprawl. So between 1970 and 1990, these and other factors caused Americans' per capita land use um, across the country to increase over 22 percent. In the, the same time period, however, uh, the amount of developed land in the United States increased over 51 percent. So what accounts for this discrepancy? The number one cause of sprawl by far, population growth. New houses, new shopping centers, new roads are being built for new residents. In recent decades, cities and states with the highest population growth rates have also shown the most sprawl. So here's a uh, a graph that I uh, took from a, a CIS study. Um, on the y-axis there, we have sprawl rates from 0 to 50 percent. And you can see that in states that had declining population growth all the way on the left, 
uh, there was still sprawl in those states. So obviously population isn't everything. On the other hand, as you look at states that had more and more population growth, um, you can see that they had a lot more sprawl. So clearly population is important to the problem. Uh, the most comprehensive study to date on the causes of sprawl in the U.S. analyzed several dozen possible factors. And grouping all the factors that can increase per capita land use and comparing these with the single factor of increased population, this study found that in America between 1982 and 1997, 52 percent of sprawl was attributable to population increase, 48 percent was attributable to these other factors. A lot of smart growth advocates resist this conclusion, and uh, as someone who's worked on some of these zoning issues at the local level, I, I sympathize with their concerns. They don't want us to lose track of the need for good transportation and zoning policies. Uh, I'm sympathetic to that. On the other hand, if we really want to tackle sprawl, it doesn't make sense to say, we're just going to take off the table that factor which causes over half of the problem. We're not going to stop sprawl and habitat loss if we simply accept continued population growth as inevitable. Now, if there was time, uh, we could go through all of our major environmental problems and show that they have a population driver as the main driver of these problems or as a significant driver. Uh, we don't have time for that. Um, I want to emphasize, though, that population growth doesn't just undermine environmental protection here at home. Uh, it also increases our footprint globally. And here, in this regard, uh, we should consider uh, global climate change. So let me briefly talk about that. And uh, to talk about climate change, I want to introduce you to my friend the pika, a little alpine rabbit who lives throughout the uh, western Rockies, and especially in my, uh, my state of Colorado. Uh, the pika is currently being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species because of loss of habitat connected to climate change. So nothing mortifies American environmentalists more than our country's failure to show leadership in combating global climate change. Uh, we feel that we have a moral responsibility to do something about this, and we're right. Many scientific models suggest that we need to reduce our emissions to 20 to 30 percent of current levels within the next five decades, so reduce it 75 to 80 percent total. That's a huge decrease. Um, our first step has to be to stop the current rise in emissions quickly, say within the next decade. Meeting even this more modest immediate objective, though, is going to prove difficult if America's population continues to grow. 